Before you hit fast forward, I have a question to ask you. Have you subscribed to our YouTube channel yet? If you haven't, you should, and here's why. We started adding videos to our content creation last week, starting with Behind the Point Spread. This is a show you're going to see live every Wednesday night during the season at 8 o'clock Central. Later this week, the return of Doc's Diagnosis, presented by Centris Federal Credit Union, a throwback from the old sports sound-off days. Dr. Rob gives you some X's and O's. Also, the podcast you're listening to right now will also be on there, so subscribe today. Nebraska lost to Northwestern. It goes without saying there will be cussing on this episode. If you don't like people passionately talking about football, turn us off now. Betfred Sportsbook presents the Doc Talk podcast. Betfred just launched its new app in the state of Iowa to rave reviews. Download the new Betfred Sportsbook app in the Apple and Google Play Store. New signups can bet $50 and get up to $250 in free bets. Betfred Sportsbook is live in Iowa, Arizona, where you can get up to a $500 risk free bet, Colorado, where you can also get up to a $500 risk free bet, Pennsylvania through the Wind Creek Casino app. And Betfred Sportsbook just announced plans to open in Maryland and Ohio, where they are are the official betting partner of the Cincinnati Bengals. Also supporting the Doc Talk podcast, Husker Hounds, with two locations in the Omaha area and online at huskerhounds.com. And attorney Connor Orr with the firm Orr, Horrigan, and Flenty. Connor is an expert litigator and a registered sports agent, and he joined us last week on episode 23. You can contact him by email, connor at ohflaw.com, or by phone at 402-408-6488. You can now find Doc Talk Sports on Facebook. On Twitter, follow Dr. Rob at Doc Talk Sports, and follow me, Travis Justice, at Travis Creates. If you have questions or comments for us, send us an email, doctalksports at gmail.com. This is the Doc Talk Podcast presented by Betfred Sportsbook 2022, episode 24. Dr. Rob, am I throwing you off, man? Because uh, the shit's changing around here. <laughs> We're getting like, like I'm on camera, I'm on screen. I'm like, can I be looking at a screen when you, I'm on? You can camera? do whatever you want, right? I'm, I'm like looking up data. Is that because you're a data analytics mathematician? scientist type thing right i am a technically i am a scientist I, yes. i've got a doctorate but the big thing now would be a a data scientist we, do you have a data scientist at ortho nebraska in analytics um actually we've got several guys crunching numbers at, at ortho nebraska it you know what you want a place where it's on the cutting edge come see us there well you know it's not on the cutting edge Nebraska, Nebraska football. football. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, you're killing me. I, I don't mean to kill you. I, I, I listen. I went on my radio show in Iowa. I, I, I come off like a Husker homer, and you know I'm not. But yet I, I defended them. You're a Cyclone guy. No, I'm not a Cyclone guy. I'm a Hawkeye guy. Okay, you married a Cyclone. But I defended them. I, I, I said, listen, things have changed. There's a different culture. There's a different feel. And okay, so I got to be honest with you. I mean, I actually do listen into the to the stream on your show on occasion when I've got the time to do so. I do have a day job. Yeah, we get rolling. I mean, we're up and running, seeing patients by six a.m. in the morning. So it's not like I have a lot of days that I can hop on, hop onto the onto the stream and listen to you guys. On the times I do, though, I got to be honest, I haven't heard you put that out there. The, the change in culture and link. No, well, I think I went into more on on Thursday and Friday because we were coming off the uh, behind the port spread with with, uh, with Scott Spritzer and just all sorts of things of you know and I, I I've done it year after year after year. I, I buy into what they're selling, and I'm like, okay, everybody just needs to pay attention. Kirk Herbstreit said Nebraska is going to be playing Ohio State in the Big Ten championship game. You start falling into it. Okay, well, it, that's why this happened. Well, it, it might be. It, it might be why it happened. Although, I mean, you talk about Vegas knowing things. That point spread when we were talking with Scott on that was, was, 13, when, that was on was Wednesday, 13, 13 and, and a half. half. I think by game time it was, what, down to 10? Uh, it was. It kept going down, and and I and I asked Scott Spreicher. I said, Scott, this line's going down. He said it's because all the money was going on Nebraska, and that or all the money 
uh, like 70% of the tickets then start switching towards Northwestern. And, and I get value. that. I get that. If everybody's putting it on one side, it's going to drive it in the other direction. That being said, I am still one of those guys that I'm, I'm just always like, God, Vegas just knows something's <laughs> up. It's, it's really, really crazy. And, and think about this seven losses in a row now. And then five wins just total in one possession games for Nebraska. They lose to Northwestern 31 to 28. And I, I put this on your Twitter page today. And, and in case anybody's wondering, uh, I do have access. I haven't been on Twitter at all today. <laughs> Because you're like a therapist. I did notice that. Yeah, like, yeah, you, like, well, I told you last night, I was like, I got I got to get off this shit. I mean, about 8 o'clock last night, I was like, we're done for a while here. Because it's just one of those, like, I'm burned out. Every Husker fan is burned out. It, I mean, it's it's you, you want answers, and there's not good ones. That's the, that, that's the killer here. There's not good answers right now. Well, the only answer that you have, and it goes back to, and I put this on your Twitter page, and it was one of our quick hits that I took from the Wednesday night show, and that was when you guys went into, I think it was Scott Spreicher, went in pretty deep on just how good of a coach, and you've been talking about it, uh, Pat Fitzgerald is. And, and we thought the, the one advantage Northwestern had over Nebraska was Pat Fitzgerald and that he could outcoach Scott Frost. And if you if you read Dirk Chatelain's uh, article in the Omaha World Herald on Sunday morning, it, that was a scathing way of saying Scott Frost got outcoached. Well, it, it is, and I don't I don't know if that's scathing though, it, or if it's that. I know what you is, mean. Is, I mean, is this that big of a revelation? No. Okay. And it's now, now here's the other thing. If you look from a schematic standpoint, I mean, a strategy standpoint, it's not like you, Pat Fitzgerald comes out there and throws a bunch of shit at you that you've never seen before. It, it's, I mean, pretty basic stuff. Oh, it is as bare bones basic as you can get. There is no flash or dash to this stuff. It is good, solid, sound, fundamental football. It, it's interesting because I saw that there was kind of a big comment thread on Twitter about how several coaches around the league, you know how they did before the season, the anonymous comments on all the different teams. So all the coaches, and I think Athlon ran it, all the different coaches could put anonymous comments for each of the different teams. So for Iowa, there was a whole list of anonymous comments that all came from all the other Big Ten coaches okay. about Iowa, about Illinois, about Nebraska, about Ohio State. There was a handful of coaches who, in referencing Nebraska, commented that it was a case of you don't have to do anything spectacular. You just need to go out there and wait for them to implode because they will. Now, I, I kind of disagree with that a little bit in the sense that I don't think it's that Nebraska necessarily is going to screw things up. But Nebraska historically, um, I thought they did okay with this under Bo Pelini, quite frankly, which is why Bo still won nine or ten games every single year. They did some basic fundamentals very well. When you went back to Mike Riley, when you go to Scott Frost, all, a lot of those basic fundamentals have gone out the window, and that's something that's been incredibly disappointing to me because I look at the coaches we had. You know, we went back at the college level, at the NFL level. It's not like we were doing some secret level coach-player interaction that turned us into these Division One or NFL football players. We were going out there every single day in practice and working on the exact same stuff that I worked on in seventh grade football. I mean, it's these bare bones basics. Let's work on your stance. We'd work on stance every day. You'd work on first step every day. You'd work on the blocking sled. You'd work on staying low. You'd work on head and shoulder position. Where are you putting your hands on that defender every play? It wasn't some high-level rocket science kind of stuff. You know, everyone used to make fun of Tom Osborne. Because it was like you knew what they were going to run all the time. I mean, it's yeah, Os like Osborne just ran it well. Yes, it's. Do you know what it is? It's the old Vince Lombardi thing where I mean, 
he had more than three plays, but the knock against, I shouldn't say the knock, the commentary with Vince Lombardi is that the Packers ran like four different plays. They just ran them perfectly. I mean, it was fuzzy Thurston pulling and blocking the crap out of some poor defender every single play. It's there's a little bit of truth to that with all of these really good coaches is that they run a, a fairly, I, I don't want to say vanilla offense or defense, but what they do run from a fundamental standpoint, they run it with very good fundamentals, very good basics, very sound form. And the, the technique tends to be flawless. And that's not something that you're seeing with Nebraska really since Pelini was down there. Here's what I noticed yesterday. And this is just what good fundamentally sound teams do is Northwestern had Nebraska's defense guessing because it was able to establish the run. Even when they went for two or three yards, they never gave up on the run. They, and they were able to break, you know, a six, seven yarder. And Nebraska never knew what was coming then. Was it going to be a pass? Was it going to be a fit? Was it had, going to be a play action yeah, pass? He had was no it? problem running on third and nine. Didn't care. He just he said, you know what? I'm I'll sacrifice a drive here just to keep them guessing on what I'm going to do on third down. And that's a key thing. I think that was a big part of it. The other thing is, is if you look at Northwestern's offensive again, I'm one of these that I spend the entire game watching the offensive lines and the defensive lines from both teams play. And on both sides of the ball, you saw Northwestern's offensive and defensive lines playing very good, sound, fundamental football. Pad position was good. Footwork was very good. Um, I, I mean, I, I get it in the sense that Northwestern has – a future NFL guy in Skaronsky at offensive tackle. But the, the the other four guys on that offensive line, I'm not saying they're NFL guys, but they play good, sound, fundamental football, and that's going to win. It, it sounds boring, but that's what's going to win you a lot of football games over time. Everybody wants that cool – uh Mike Leach, Texas Tech offense that he had back in the day. Everybody wants the offense that Scott Frost showed at Central Florida with Mackenzie Milton. You know, the, that stuff works in a, in a, in a watered-down Big 12. Sometimes it works in the AAC. When you get into leagues like the Big 10, the SEC, that's not going to work. And I've talked about this a hundred times before on this show that when I went to the NFL, I thought I was going to have is like, I was going to have like the, the area 51 playbook opened up to me of how to play great football. And I remember one of the last times I had a chance to sit and talk with Tom Osborne before I went to the NFL, it would have been really early summer of 95 he told me, he goes, hey, you're going to do fine. Don't get too caught up in all the hoopla. At the end of the day, it's nothing other than blocking well and tackling well, even at that level. And at the time he told me that, you know, I tried to store that nugget away, but even I was like, come on, coach, this is, this is the NFL. This is going to be a whole new level. And then I got there. And we're doing stuff that Pee Wee football coaches are working on with their kids. It's 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 first step. It's what's your stance look like? We need to adjust that. Hey, let's get your pad level down. Let's stay low. I mean, it's it's stuff that's so incredibly simplistic, but the teams that do well at the NFL level, the teams that do well at the college level, if you go watch an Alabama, a Clemson, an Ohio State, a Georgia, anybody who's playing really well, anybody who's playing a high level of football, their fundamentals are incredibly sound, and Nebraska did not have that yesterday. It's almost like you thought you were going to be uh, introduced to the Illuminati, right? You you were like, I'm going to be enlightened when I go to the NFL. I was. And then the enlightenment was everything you needed to know was taught to you at a very young age. Yeah, we taught you all this shit in third grade. You should, you should have paid attention. How mad are you today? We're recording this on Sunday. Because okay. last night we went live on YouTube right after the game. 
And you you were fired up. You you you, you a couple f bombs flew by. <laughs> you you were pretty fired up. Your voice was gone. You'd watch it at a Husker bar in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Have you calmed down, or have you just like? Or are you surprised that Scott Frost has a job? Uh, now, now that there's less, there's way less alcohol in me. I, I mean, we killed. A, I don't even remember what it was, but it was a local Sioux Falls beer that we were we were hitting it pretty hard up there at McNally's in Sioux Falls, and it was a. Uh, you know, I was. I, I get it. I was fired up. Now that I've had a chance to kind of settle down and think about it a little bit. It's not like we've seen anything different going all the way back to 2015 when Mike Riley hit the door. I, I mean, the loss of fundamentals, the loss of good conditioning and strength training. Um, it's just, it, it's kind of been sort of, it, I mean, it, it, it's Sandlot football. I mean, we've literally been dealing with seven or eight years of Sandlot football here. And that's what's disappointing to me. And I think that's why I'm upset because you would expect at some point somebody would step back and take a look at this big picture. And I think there's coaches on the staff who do think this way. I think a guy like Bill Bush is like, hey, you know what, with special teams, let's go back to just some bare bones basics. Let's find a guy who can punt the ball. Let's find a couple of guys who can kick. Let's work on some coverage. I thought for the most part, special teams did fine. I don't think they saw anything really out of the ordinary. Like I said, Northwestern doesn't throw a lot of flash and dash. or They're not going to come out there with a bunch of trickeration. Is they're, trickeration a word? I don't know. Somebody I was probably Barry Switzer Trickeration. I don't. Tri you've never heard trickeration. I've never heard trickeration. Some coach used that, and I'm blanking on who it was. I have no idea who used the word trickeration. It was like a. It was like somebody in the old Southwest Conference or SEC used that word once. But I can see like Keith Jackson using it. Yeah. Oh, daddy, look at the trickeration. Exactly. See, it was somebody Southern. That's all I remember. <laughs> but I mean, it's, you're not going to see anything goofy from them. You're going to you're going to see guys who are going to line up and try to play good, sound, fundamental football. And for the most part, if you come out and do that for four quarters, you're going to win most of your games. And I think that's Pat Fitzgerald figured that out a long time ago. Well, you mentioned trickeration. Scott Frost tried some trickeration uh, yesterday. Of course, the onside kick is still uh, well, that's like a kick right in the nuts. Uh, but he did take full responsibility for the horrible call. I made that call, so that's on me. Um, you know, at the at that point in the game, I thought all the momentum was on our side. I thought if we got it, we could end the game. Um, and it, the way we were playing, uh, you know, I I felt at that point like uh, like we had a really good chance of winning the game, and I felt like maybe we were the better team. And you know. I, you can't really foresee them scoring 14 straight um, and us sputtering after we'd played well to start the second half on offense. So, again, those are excuses. If I had it over, I wouldn't make the call. Did they really play well in the second half? And the reason I bring that up, the the one touchdown – uh, took an, it was led or started by an incredible Casey Thompson scramble that was still one of the most athletic plays I've seen on a Nebraska football team maybe since uh, Taylor Martinez. And, and if there's and if there's a if there's a bright spot here, we've got a guy. We I shouldn't say we've got a guy. You have guys who can make those kind of plays on this team because they very well may need that to win games this year. It's so my take on that is, is that if you think you're the better team, if you think you've got the solid chance to win the game, if you think you have the better athletes, then you go and let them play because the risk reward ratio there is completely skewed. If you're truly the better team and you just scored a second straight touchdown to go up by two scores, kick it deep and force those guys to go the length of the field to, to cut it down to one score. It's it's the, the and, and see, this is if there's something I'm pissed about, it's that kind of thinking because a really good, very solid football coach is going to be sitting there going, okay, we just scored twice to go up by two scores. 
let's 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 make these guys beat us. If we're truly the better team, they're going to have to beat us. Why take a chance on beating ourselves? And when you do an onside kick, there is always a chance that you are going to beat yourself. When you just go up and kick off, you're telling the other team, hey, you, you've you got to beat us. We're not going to help you. Well, well, it was a fundamentally poorly run onside kick. The, the dude... Well, to begin with, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he kicked it right to a running back. Well, and it's, you know, I'd, I'd give you the point. The running back ran up and caught the ball within 10 yards. So if Nebraska had gotten there prior to him, that, that, was, a head, that was a heads up play by the by the receiving team there. It's like they weren't caught off guard by it. Um, preparation. And you, the, you think Pat? You think a Pat Fitzgerald team is not going to be prepared at this point? Come on. Hey, that's fair. That's it's, fair. So here's the thing, though, is that those the, the the receiving team, those guys ran up and were. You had three guys. Now, granted, they were spread out, but you had three guys that all of a sudden, at the point of where the kick was coming. We're inside that 10 yard mark. So even if Nebraska recovers it, the ball hasn't gone 10 yards. I mean, it's, it's, that's nothing other than very good special teams coaching. Oh, you recognize it's an onside kick. Let's run up so if the, and, and see if we can stop the ball. That way, if the, the, and I don't know what the rules are on if you on the kickoff team, if you touch it first, if it's all of a sudden the ball's now live and you, if if the kicking team recovers within 10 yards. But it, it, it kind of creates a little cloudiness for the refs there where if, if Nebraska recovers that and the kick hasn't gone 10 yards yet, well, that's a penalty on Nebraska and they got to re-kick it. So, they, I mean, it was very smart, very heads-up play by Northwestern's receivers. They understood the situation. They recognized immediately and adjusted. The bottom line, though, is, is that this is, a, this is kind of a, at best case scenario with onside kicks, it's probably right. I mean, that's a 50-50 shot. That you're going to recover an onside kick, probably far less. Than I was going to say, I think you're being generous at fifty. Yeah, so I mean, it's it's a high risk, it's a high risk, high reward. I get the high reward part, but in a game where you've just gone up by two scores, don't do the high risk, high reward, and give them a chance to suddenly get back in the game. And that, I mean, that was Frost essentially. That chance to get back in the game, Frost handed that to Northwestern on a platter by trying the onside kick. It was a bad call. And in that situation, if Nebraska gets in that exact same situation 12 times a season and Frost makes that call 12 times, every single time, it's a bad call. That was not, That's not one of those... I'm trying to way to phrase it. In hindsight, looking back at it, it's easy to say, hey, that didn't work out. It was a bad call. That's one of those situations before you make the call, Frost says, hey, let's go for an onside kick. The entire fucking coaching staff should have said, this is a moronic idea. Don't do it or we're all walking. Do you really think Scott made the call? No. Well, shit. I gotta be I mean, honest. He's gotta with you. sign off on it, right? I yeah, mean, I don't know. That's that's a tough one. I don't know. I, I don't see Bill Bush making that call because he tends to be one of these guys who he tends to be kind of a pretty fundamentally sound guy in terms of how he thinks and has run special teams in the past. I don't see him making that call. Um I think that's. I mean, somebody, somebody else might have made it outside of Frost. I, I, I don't see the offensive coordinator making it because if they don't get it, you're not getting the ball back. And like you yourself said, statistically, that's that's a pretty high risk. It, it's a low percentage time that you actually recover it. The the amazing thing is every time Nebraska screws up, which seems to be a lot at the most inopportune times. 
you know, let's go back to the Iowa game a year ago. They're up. They're going to beat Iowa. The block punt. And it's a, and they, and even but that at, wasn't a trick play. That was no, just poor special I, I, I teams did, fundamentals. Is, it, it's it's funny how a play sucks the life. Can change can, can, can completely change yeah, the and that, perspective. And that's all I'm getting because even after Iowa scored there, Nebraska still had the lead. Right? Nebraska, they did. They were still up by a score. So even when I think a touch by a full touch. Yeah. So when Northwestern scored after the onside kick, Nebraska still had the lead. But Mo- it, momentum's gone. Yes. Hundred percent. It's it's a real thing, and that's the thing. And I mean, you ask, well, do you think somebody other than Frost suggested that? Name me a defensive coach who likes onside kicks. There is not a single defensive coach out there, whether it's a coordinator or a position coach, who is like, oh yeah, onside kick. This is a good idea. There is not a one. There is not a. You will never ever, ever find a defensive coach who agree, who likes the concept of the onside kick, no matter what the – you can be up by five touchdowns with three minutes left in a game, and you can say, hey, let's do an onside kick just for shits and giggles, and every defensive coach on your staff is just going to be like, yeah, this is not a good idea. We shouldn't do this. It's So it wasn't anybody on defense. I doubt it was Bill Bush – you know, I, well, if it's not Bill Bush, then it's got to be Scott. Nobody else can. After make that, that I don't. Th- yeah, I don't think Whipple or Mickey or any Applewhite or anybody else on offense would make that call and say, "Hey, here's a great idea. Let's do this." So, I mean, if you kind of break it down like that, I'm sitting there going, "Like, yeah, I kind of do think it probably was Frost's call." And it was a horrible fucking call. Sorry, Dave. But it was ridiculous. This was that right there was exactly the last time, the last time in place you would want to make that call. I understand that you've got some momentum. You've just scored twice. You maybe got them on their heels just a little bit. But that's also the time that you would sit back and you go, okay, it's fucking Pat Fitzgerald. When is his when has he ever had teams that were on their heels, unprepared, not looking ahead, and not not ready to take on anything? I mean, this is a team that I mean, people kind of don't talk about it as much, but twice in the last four years they've gone to the Big Ten title game. And it's he an is even a, year. Even they win. I get it. I mean, and you know, I don't buy into the whole even odd thing. It's just you've got a guy who's taken who's won the Big Ten West 50% of the time out of the last four years. The guy's a pretty good coach. You think his team's not going to be prepared to deal with this? Yeah, they are. This is the last guy that I, you know, Jeff Brom and and Purdue. Little freewheeling, yeah. I'll try an onside kick against them. Um, Iowa, definitely not. Indiana, yeah. I would probably try it against Indiana just for s's and g's. But I mean, it's one of these things where I just there's certain coaches that are going to have their teams really well prepared to deal with any eventuality. And the king of all this is Pat Fitzgerald. Why the hell would you call this play at this point in time against that particular team and coach? It's idiotic. Very much so. And it's still baffling. When, when I remember when I watched it, I'm like, what are you thinking? Oh, my God. I was going ape shit in the bar. I know. I, was, I could not believe they were trying that now, at that point in time. Now, that's the low-hanging fruit. That, that That's low-hanging fruit. It and- is, but it's it's... Okay, you know what? Because I want to get Okay, hold on. I know you're going to go something. I got one thing I got to say. There is a fucking shit ton of low-hanging fruit in the Scott Frost era. (laughs) You're right. You you are correct. You I mean, it's like, dude, I can pick this shit all day long because there's a ton of it. That's not a good sign. Now, after the game yesterday, uh, you put your report card out on Twitter. I actually, and this was pretty quick. I mean, this is there's reasons why I picked the grades I did. I'm not saying I'm right. Did I push back on you on a couple? I did. I said, "Hey, are you sure about this?" Yeah, 
Yeah, it, but you came back with, with with an excuse. There's reasons why. There, there, so let's start. Um, and, and this is where I want to get, get into. It, it's the running game. You gave the running game an F. Despite the long touchdown run, I would agree with you. That's one play. One play. I don't think, I don't feel, Rob. And, the, and, the, and, and Grant made a great play to break a tackle on that one. So even that one, I mean, if you really want to split hairs, that one play should have been like a six yard gain. Well, I he made a great play to break a tackle. I don't feel Nebraska ever, ever tried to establish the run. No, hundred percent correct. I totally agree with you. You can't win in the Big Ten if you don't establish the run, or uh-uh. at least try. Guess who established the run yesterday? Northwestern did in a big way, big time. Yeah, it was easy to see. I, you know, I mean, because it. it when you look at the stats, it, it can it can get a little misleading. I mean, you look at the overall stats. You look at Nebraska. You look at the fact that and well, how did Nebraska do? Oh, shit, Anthony Grant had just over a hundred yards rushing. I mean, yeah, but in, in a pass ha- was a huge part of that. Yeah, in a in a pass happy offense in this day and age in this era of wide open offenses, if you've got a hundred yard runner. That's pretty damn good. He had, and, but then you look, then you kind of take a step back and go, wait a second. Half of that came on one single play. Yeah. And it was a play where he did a great job of breaking a tackle and busting it to the house. And so I, I've, I've dumped a bunch of praise on Northwestern here. Good, solid fundamentals, incredibly, incredibly good fundamental football. At the same time, it's not like you look at Northwestern and go, damn, here's a bunch of Olympic track athletes. It's not. Anthony Grant breaking a tackle and outrunning that defense is not exactly like something to hang your hat on. You you know, I mean, Ohio State's going to be way better than that. Michigan State's going to be better than that. Illinois and Indiana are going to have better athletes back there than 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 what Northwestern's got. So Nebraska, one hundred ten yards of of rushing on thirty one attempts. It's three. Now, point- and keep in mind, Anthony Grant had what one hundred and one of that. Let me get back to. It. Let me. Uh, you you've yeah. Googled it. Pull up the stats. Yeah. Here. So yeah, he had one hundred and one on nineteen attempts. So I mean, I mean, the vast majority. I mean, it's essentially, I know I'm. I don't want to break it down and say, well, it's 46%. But basically, half the rushing yardage for Nebraska came on one play. Yeah, and, I, and I know... You know what that is? Uh, not trying to establish That's the run. That's not a good thing. It's not a good running game. And, and Nebraska's 42 pass attempts. Um, you had Northwestern with 38 pass attempts. 27 to 38. Helensky was good. He, he was poised. So when we talk, oh, I just blanked it. Our our man from Northwestern. Oh, uh, uh, was it Jeff? Yeah, Vicar. Yeah, yeah, Louis. Louis Vicar. Louis Vicar. There yeah. we go. I don't know why Jeff was in my head. I love Jeff. I don't know who Jeff is, but you just love Jeff. I love Jeff. Anyway, <laughs> so Louis. I mean, he made the point that he wasn't. I, I don't think Louis was a hundred percent sold on. Uh, on Holinsky, but you got a guy. I mean, he was he was an ACC guy. Um, transfer was in North Carolina. No, State? he was he was South Carolina. South Carolina. Okay, but you've got an ACC guy. I mean, comes in. He's got a year under his belt now. Now I mean, it, he kind of knows the system. He's comfortable he with it. He finally has the same offensive coordinator. They said he's never had yeah. the same offensive coordinator for two years in a row. This is the first time. Yeah, he was new last year. But, yeah, so you've got an O coordinator second year. you got a D coordinator second year for Northwestern. But, yeah, when you look at what they did things well offensively, both in the run and pass game, I keep going back to Nebraska and the fact that, yeah, when – Almost half your total rushing yardage comes on one play. That's not a good day. And that's why you gave him an F. Yeah. And the offensive line wasn't very good. No, I you know what? I was a little bit gentle with my what what grade did I give the O line? You gave the O line a C minus. Okay. I was probably kind of okay there. 
run blocking was super sketchy. Now the passing now, game, you gave a B, which Nebraska was and that twenty-five was, of forty-two for two picks. Yeah, although that that second pick was, I mean, last drive of the game for Nebraska. I'm sure they're pressing a little. Do you think Adrian Martinez ball, was in Manhattan, Kansas, laughing his ass off? Big time. Um, and on that second pick, the ball hit the receiver right in the hands. It really did. I mean, it's that one. I'm not. I'm not super. Was upset that Oliver about. Martin? I think it was Oliver Martin. I think it was. was. It? Yeah. But I mean, the ball went it went in and out of his hands, popped up into the air. Defender caught a caught a can of corn right there. So, what are you going to do? I but, mean, that would that's one where I'm like, I get it. It's it's a turnover. It's an interception, and it was a drive killer on a potentially game time drive. But you hit the receiver right in the hands. I mean, what else is Thompson going to do? So I don't I don't put a ton of blame on him for that one. The fumble I thought was not a great call. When I watched that, when I actually I mean I, I kind of tangented into turnovers here. Sorry, that's fine. But on that fumble, I actually thought he was down. I thought there was a reasonable camera angle that showed a knee down. You just couldn't see the. I mean, you could tell that the ball probably had not come out yet. You just couldn't see the ball, but in the angle where the knee was on the ground, so they had to they had to they, go ahead and stay with the fumble because they didn't call. confirm it. They just said stands is called. Which exactly means- there there was there wasn't good enough video to overturn it, but it didn't confirm it either. So I, I truly do not think that was a fumble. But again, you know, one of the great lessons that Osborne always taught was he said. At the end of the day, you have to play well enough to overcome some of these unpredictables. And Osborne always talked about there's going to be some officiating calls that go go against you. You have to play well enough to overcome that. You have to play well enough to overcome a bad kick. If a game comes down to a potential game tying or game winning field goal, that's not the kicker's fault. That's the rest of the team's fault for not winning by more than that margin. And that's the same thing with these turnovers. But at the same time, at the end of the day, it was three turnovers. Northwestern had one. But it's, it's, uh, well, the TOP was still, I, I mean. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's that was the first stat I asked you about immediately for, for the what was the time of possession. And you had, what was it, a, a, roughly about a 10-minute. Oh, yeah, about nine minutes. Yeah, time, time of possession advantage to Northwestern. That's huge. Now, what grade did I give the defense? You gave the defense a B. Minus, so, B minus. I'd be willing to drop that to a C plus. Boy, everybody, that's where people went all People over are upset, but it's, so I'm, so I'm tangenting here. I kind of went into this a little bit on Twitter. Go back to the 1990 Nebraska football team. So this was the year that Nebraska gave up four fourth quarter scores to Colorado in Lincoln on senior night, it was the, it was the Kenny Walker senior night game in Lincoln. Um, brutal weather, awesome game, loudest. That actually might be the loudest I've ever heard Memorial Stadium. The fans legitimately wanted to see if they could overcome Kenny Walker's deafness, and I say that not joking. I'm dead serious. I know you I are. I know you are. Um, Nebraska's defense lived on the field that day. The offense could not put together sustained drives. And by the fourth quarter, they were com- the defense was completely gassed. Colorado scored four times to win the game. A couple weeks later, Nebraska goes down to Oklahoma and gets absolutely pasted by a good but not great Gary Gibbs coached Oklahoma team. A month after that, we go down to... Orlando and get just blown out by, you know, it was actually a pretty damn good Georgia Tech team that ended up actually sharing the national title with Colorado that year. So th- two out of our three losses were to the co-national champs. 
But it was a defense that was somewhat maligned by the fact that they'd given up these two these two big blowouts to Georgia Tech and Col- not Colorado, sorry, to Georgia Tech and Oklahoma, but had this big fourth quarter meltdown against Colorado. And that was a defense that really kind of got raked over the coals. But when you go back and look, you realize if you include the nickel and dime defensive backs that played on that defense in 1990, it was like 13 out of 11 starters made it to the NFL. They may not have lasted, but you had 12 or 13 guys who played on that defense go to the NFL. That is a mind-blowing number. That was an amazing, amazingly talented defense. They spent that season absolutely living on the field. Time of possession that year was brutal in the opponent's favor. And it was the same thing I saw yesterday. You get a 10-minute time of possession differential, your defense is going to get gassed. I don't care how deep you are. I don't care how good you are. You can have a whole slew of NFL guys. Eventually, with that kind of time differential, guys are going to get gassed, and they're going to start getting gashed on both run and pass plays. 528 yards of total offense by Northwestern, though. Northwestern, 528 yards of total offense. Well, and that's the other thing. It was good fundamental football. I saw very early on, I thought Nebraska's defense, I saw flashes of stuff that I thought were outstanding. Um, The other thing is that, you know, part of my grade is maybe a little of extra credit carryover from last season. I'm looking at some of these guys. I, I mean, I look at Ty Robinson. I look at Hendricks. I look at Reimers. I look at a number of these other guys on that defense where I'm like, it's not an untalented group. These are these are some very good football players. And the thing that kills me is that you're going to be watching a lot of these guys going on to the NFL. I mean, there's a reason Luke Gifford is in the NFL. There's a reason all these other guys that you can come up. I mean, just give me a name, but there's guys that are in the NFL. I think Luke Reimers has a really solid chance of playing in the NFL. I think Nick Henricks definitely plays in the NFL. I think Ty Robinson plays in the NFL. I think Nash Huttmacher goes to the NFL. Um, I think Garrett Nelson has a really good chance of going to the NFL. These, I, I think Ochan Mathis, you know, and, and there's a guy that I'm, I'm sitting here going like, yeah, I don't, dude, did you ever hear, I mean, when was Oshan in the game? Did he make it in? Did he get any sacks? You go and look at the stats. He, he had the second most tackles for Nebraska as a defensive end, as a rush, rush or edge guy. It's, you know, he was out there making plays. It's just I think Nebraska's offense put these guys in a horrible position so many times. Field position. Now, here's the other stat. Can you? I don't know if you're going to be able to find this one, but is average starting field position in there anywhere? Uh, it's not, but I would say Northwestern had a pretty good. Oh, they freaking own Nebraska yeah. in that. And that was, a, that was brutal. I mean, Nebraska was starting inside the 20s so many times. That that that's a tough that's a tough stat that it's it's kind of one of those hidden stats that I don't think gets out there as much or doesn't get as much credit as it deserves. But. So uh, Northwestern, this is uh, let's just go down. Northwestern started on Nebraska's twenty five, started on Nebraska's forty eight, started on Nebraska's twenty five, started on Nebraska's eleven. That's a tough one. Started on Nebraska's eighteen, started on Nebraska's twenty three. The 25, then the 44, and then it started on Nebraska's 24, Nebraska's 11. It's not as good as you think, but there's a couple on the on the 40. There's one in the 44. Yeah, one but the I mean, if you're if you're I'm 20 not, plus, you're fine. Yeah, because at your worst case scenario is you punt, and the other team's going to be starting on roughly their 20. What's What's uh, what's Nebraska's average starts? Can you uh, pull that up? Yeah, so Nebraska started on its own or uh, uh, on the twenty-five. 
Uh, and I shouldn't say Nebraska. They started on their own or uh, on their own twenty-five. Nebraska started on its one. Uh, That's then, brutal. Then it started on its forty-eight. That's not bad. Started on its twenty. And the other ones I said, Nebraska, Northwestern started Nebraska's twenty-five. I had it mixed up. They were starting on their own on all those. Um, but Nebraska started on the twenty, the seventeen. That's tough. The six. That's tough. Uh, the twenty-seven. That's not. It's not horrible. Yeah. The twelve. That's tough. Uh, bu- bu- the forty-six. That's solid. Yeah, twenty-five. It's okay. Uh, thirty-five. Okay. Uh, twenty. So so. Twenty-five. Decent. Forty-three. Good. Um, and the four. That's tough. Here's why I get confused. So there was I, the stats. It's N E B and then N U, but I get confused because gotcha. <laughs> yeah, it's it's N U and yeah. and N W. I mean, the the whole N U thing is idiotic, but. Yeah. If you look at it, though, there wasn't a single, single digit yard mark spot for Northwestern. There was three for Nebraska. One of the things that's been concerning to me over the last several years with Scott Frost has been the lack of discipline, the lack of fundamentals. It's these million and one little things they don't do right. And that's not the kind of thing you bring in half a new coaching staff and change in one year. That's, I mean, that's endemic stuff. I mean, that's stuff that's ingrained within a program that you're not going to change like that. Now, I, I think they fixed the special team stuff, the turnovers. I'm not ready to call this team a turnover prone team with the with the three turnovers they had because I thought the fumble was a bad call. And I thought the second interception on the last drive, you you hit the guy, you hit the receiver in the hands with the ball. It went squirted through his hands, popped up in the air. Defender gets an easy catch there. I mean, what are you going to do? They had one turnover that I thought was legitimately the offense's fault. So, there you go. So I, it's it's hard for me to blame the turnovers, but it's it's the million and one little things. It's these little coaching decisions that haunt you, like the onside kick. Those are the things that drive me nuts. It's the offensive line uh, on the second touchdown, on second down, and their quote unquote first third down because there was a penalty on the play. Um, the offensive line got too high. Defenders got underneath and literally stood the entire offensive line up right at the point of attack and stuffed, the, and stuffed those two plays. These are fundamentals. These are bare bones basics that you don't see happening. And we haven't seen them happen since Mike Riley hit the door. Scott Frost didn't correct this stuff either. It's not like you're going to see a change around in one year on these million and one little things. And that's why when you say if you take a team that is very well coached and tends to be fundamentally very sound, like Northwestern, if they play 10 times, that's why I'm like, yeah, I bet Northwestern wins six out of 10. So, you know, everybody was wondering what Scott Frost was going to be like in his uh, postgame press conference yesterday. And they were just waiting for him to throw somebody underneath the bus. Because he's never, everybody says he always passes the buck, never never takes blame. Now, to be fair, he he owned the onside kick. I'm going to play this for you, and I may have a different opinion. Does it sound like he's throwing somebody under the bus here? You tell me. I think we're going to have to learn as an offensive staff that uh, you got to be a little creative in this league. Um, so we, we have some things that we can work on. That we did a lot of good things, but it's got to be more of a um, a complete game. So did he throw the offensive staff under the bus? Well, he at least threw Whipple under the bus. <laughs> 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 Whoever was calling the plays, he threw him under the bus. Okay, so now I, I'm going to play this because I didn't think that was as damning. I didn't think he was throwing him under the bus by saying, hey, we got to know what this league is about. Well, Scott, you should know what this league is about. You should have communicated. I thought this was more of a damning um, statement when somebody asked him if he missed calling plays. Okay? If he missed calling plays. It's tough for me. You know, uh, I've said this. There's no one way to do things. Um, 
but I think uh, I think we can cooperate and a little bit more. Um, Which means you're yeah, not the, the, probably the big the thing that hurt our offense is when we got in in situations where we we're just uh, running the ball. Um, we didn't we weren't efficient enough, and um, when you gain yards on those plays, it gives you more opportunities to run the stuff that that you think could hit big. Cooperate a little bit more. Cooperate a little bit. That means there's a gap in cooperation there. Wow. That now, was kind of shocking to hear the word cooperation. Yeah, that, well, that, I mean, both those comments, uh, I mean, to me say there's there's very little or very little uh, constructive work going on between Frost and Whipple is what that tells me. But that's not healthy. That's not good. No, it's not. Now, you know, I, I don't think anybody, I mean, you listen to interviews with Pat Narduzzi up at, uh, up at Pitt. It's not like that ended well. I mean, you, you saw the comments that Narduzzi had where he was like, yeah, we'd be running the ball. We'd be getting 10 yards of carry and Whipple still wanted to pass the ball. But if you went back and looked at the statistics, you saw that, well, God, you know, Pitt was still run the ball 44% or 46% of the time. I mean, it's it, it seemed like there was a rift there between Narduzzi and Whipple when they were both at Pitt together. Maybe, maybe Whipple's one of these guys who comes in and he's just like, "Hey, I'm going to do it my way. Don't bo- don't bother me, kid." I, I and, thought- and maybe that, and that may be his thing. On the flip side, at least from a recent history standpoint, the three years Whipple was at Pitt prior to this season were Narduzzi's three best years at Pitt. So uh, you, you, we're on video now, and it's not as easy to take a break. So I'm going to, to read a couple of advertisements, Rob. You go take a pee. Okay? All right. I'm on it. Because you're like, I, he, when Rob just grabbed <laughs> his crotch, he's like, I got to pee, man. So I'm going to read a couple ads. You go ahead and go pee, and we'll see how fast you can drain Kill, that vein. You're killing me, I am, I am killing you. But sports fans, just to let you know, uh, it's time to start winning on your own terms. You're going to go pee? I shut oh, your mic off. I can go. Yeah, so I shut your microphone off, so I'm going to go ahead and read a couple ads because we have we have the benefit of doing that. I mean, it's 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 kind of nice. Uh, but I've been telling you all along about Betfred Sports. Uh, Betfred Sports has got a brand new app. Now you're probably thinking, okay, the majority of people who listen to this podcast live in Nebraska. I get that, I understand that. Uh, but I would also say the majority of listeners to this podcast live in the Omaha uh, and, and Lincoln area, where it's easy enough to drive across the river into the state of Iowa, uh, download the Betfred Sports app, and place your bets. Let's be honest. You like the bet. I mean, if you've ever been into a uh, a parking lot in one of the Iowa casinos, they're not Iowa cars there. Those are Nebraska cars that are sitting in the Iowa casinos. And Bedford Sports is the leading uh, sports book in the state of Iowa. And it's it, it, they, they just renovated it. Not renovated it. They redid the whole damn app. And it looks really good. And here's the deal. For everybody who is a new customer to Betfred Sports, I'm offering you a deal here. And I think it's a really good deal um, because it's something free. Uh, You drive across the river. Uh, and you can download the app even before you get over there. But make sure you get the Iowa app. Uh, and or, or if you're in Colorado or Arizona, this will work for you too. But you download the app, you sign up, and all new signups are going to get a $20 free bet by using the promo code DOCTALK. All one word, Doc Talk, all one word, and you're going to get a $20 free bet for just for signing up uh, with Betfred Sports. Uh, also, you can receive up to $250 in free bets in Iowa when you bet just $50. Uh, if you have a taste for football, motorsports, a little bit of baseball, doesn't matter. Betfred has you covered. A variety of betting types, including straight bets, in-play wagering, parlay cards, teasers, and more. Uh, who wouldn't want to get on the action? The app was designed with every better in mind, providing user-friendly layouts, safe and secure ways to deposit or withdraw and competitive betting markets. I've been a customer of Betfred going on uh, two years now. Uh, and I and I can tell you their customer service is second to none. You won't find any uh, better customer service in the business. Also, they have new and improved ways to withdraw and deposit your money. That's what you want. You want to be able to get your money in quick. You want to be able to get your money out quick as well. So uh, Betfred, uh, just go to betfredsports.com or go to the Apple and Google Play stores and download the app right there. We also want to thank our good buddy, uh, Scott Strunk. It was good to see Scott Strunk at our live 
recording at Cross Train last week. It, it's been a while since we've seen Scott. Two locations in the Omaha area with Husker Hounds, and you can go to huskerhounds.com. I, I, I know he didn't take the loss well. I promise you, Rob, he did not take that loss well. He was all geared up for the season. And I, I, I haven't talked to him, but I, I, I promise you it's... I've, I've traded a couple messages with Scott early. Yeah, how'd that go? He's, he's, he's okay. Okay. Just he's wanna, okay. Just want to make sure he's okay. I mean, keep in mind, I played on... I was a former team captain. I know you were. I mean, if I'm not... If I'm pissed off, you know Scott's not Well, well man. Well, but your livelihood depends on the, the, the success yeah, and that's failure true. of Nebraska football. It makes a difference. It, it makes a huge difference. And he's he's such a big fan. Uh, and he's a good dude. Uh, so, you know, the, the home opener is coming up uh, this weekend. Uh, make sure to go to Husker Hounds. Two locations in the Omaha area. Get your Husker gear right there. And one of the smartest dudes besides Dr. Rob that we have on this podcast is uh, Connor Orr. He uh, just opened his up his own firm, Orr, Horgan, and Flenty. Uh, you can reach out to him at Connor at OHFlaw.com. He he wasn't able to tell us, and I can't put the, you know say anything yet. But he's got some nil deals. He's 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 a sports agent. He's wanted in on this. He's passionate about it. Um, and I I think we need nil is ever changing, and that's why we have to have him back like over and over and over and over again. Right? You need somebody who lives in that world, yes, and he we does. Don't. He yeah. does. And it's, I mean, his knowledge base is great with this yeah. stuff and he's fun to talk to. Hey, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel because coming up on YouTube this week, there's going to be a lot of action on YouTube. Uh, Rob's going to actually think like he has a second job here. Uh, but uh, the doctor's diagnosis is back, brought to you by Centris Federal Credit Union. Uh, that's going to happen on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. We're going to release three plays that Doc does a diagnosis on. Uh, he'll kind of draw on the telestrator, kind of break down uh, why a play succeeded and why a play uh, failed. Uh, we we, we do three plays this week, but uh, just follow us on YouTube. Those will be released uh, one on Monday, one on Tuesday, and one on Wednesday. Speaking of Wednesday, 8 o'clock at night live on YouTube is Behind the Point Spread. Uh, we are live with Scott Spritzer out of Las Vegas. Lots of good information right there. We're going to be respectful of your time. We're going to go half hour. All right, we're going to talk about the Nebraska game. We're going to talk about the Iowa game. We're going to pick two other uh, football games that are coming up this weekend and let you, you know, get into the, the mind of a. Uh, when we talk data analytics, <laughs> Scott is data analytics to it. He is. Yeah. Although I'm going to be, inter- I'm going to be interested to see what he has to say about the North Dakota games because it's well, it's one of the. He may not even touch it. You know, everybody thinks that gamblers bet on everything. There's been. I think he lays off more than than most people ever ever realize. Um, so that's coming up uh, Wednesday night at eight o'clock. All the more reason to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Who's the uh, Who's Iowa got? Uh, Iowa's got what? South Dakota State. It's not a bad uh, game. No, well, it's not a bad game. I mean, they almost the knocked pl- off. Was it South Dakota or South Dakota State that almost knocked off Minnesota? That was Keegan Johnson. Yeah, that would. Uh, that was South Dakota State. Yeah, so Keegan had wasn't ki- Keegan. Keegan's at Iowa. It was Cade. That's right. I'm sorry. So it was Cade that had the kickoff yeah. return called back yeah. because it was just an atrocious yeah. holding call. But you, you had a Johnson kid. They, they're they all bright. They can all play great great at, great at football. Um, but, yeah, it's they're good athletes up there. They play good football. Both South Dakota and South Dakota State right now are, are playing at a very high level. That's one of those games that – you know, with Iowa, you can't discount it. Iowa's got a kind of a weird number of losses to one double A schools. Well, they've never. Well, it's always on. it's always north. It's always northern Iowa. Yeah, but they haven't lost to northern Iowa. But it's it's always close. They they, they have they never lost to northern Iowa. They I, they haven't lost to northern. Iowa. They lost to to what? Did they lose to North Dakota State? I think they lost to North Dakota State a couple years ago. Yeah, we're gonna have to look this one up because yeah. somebody somebody from FCS snuck a win in there. Or two. I think it was North Dakota State. Iowa State is lost. Now Iowa State's been beaten by you and I. Iowa State's been been beaten by a couple of, of Division One to. I want to see what Google says because I, I God I swear to God the Hawkeyes did did had a little damage no, done to them. No North Dakota State. That's it. Okay. I mean you're the you're the Iowa guy. That's right. Thank you for finally acknowledging <laughs> that. My God, it's about time. Well, and, and that's well with North Dakota coming up for Nebraska. This is, and I mean this in all sincerity. You and I were talking before you even came into the to the to the studio today, and that is these next two games mean nothing. The next measuring stick really is Oklahoma, right? I mean, the next Georgia Southern and North Dakota mean nothing 
All right, you're 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 correct. They they have played seven times. Yeah. Northern Iowa is zero and seven Thank against. You. I know you think I'm stupid. I know I, I. It's not. I don't think you're stupid. I just think you're from Iowa. <laughs> Where are you from? Michigan. <laughs> Where are your folks from? It wasn't Michigan. <laughs> Where are your folks from? <laughs> They're both from Iowa. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Hold on. I'm Googling Iowa versus FCS opponents. And we're going to see what comes up. Because now I am kind of curious here. I want I, I want this track record. So. Yeah, I don't. I think you're going to find what North Dakota State is about it when it comes to FCS, which, uh, and that's not a bad loss. Most people go, "Oh, we lost to North Dakota State." Okay, yeah, they're they're pretty. That, that's basically that'd be like losing to like a like a Northern Iowa, South Florida, Arkansas State. It'd be like losing to a kind of a. Like, like an FBS mid major. Okay, now and the Jackrabbits, by the way, number two in the preseason poll. So let me now. Let's go back to Nebraska because you've been ignoring this subject, and I don't want you to ignore that. This Nebraska subject. sucks. Well, you said it, not me. Um, do these next two games matter? No, they don't. Do well, they? hold on a second here because. You know what? I I can sit here and crack wise about Iowa and their record. They're at least in my head, their record against FCS opponents. But the truth of the matter is, I mean, you look back. So Nebraska played. I thought it was. I thought it was South Dakota. Was it South Dakota or South Dakota State? I thought it was South Dakota State. It was. It was. Um, if I recall correctly, that, that was a hell of a game. Yeah, that was. I mean, South Dakota State. They kind of came ready to play. Um, Nebraska's had some close wins against some very iffy opponents. When you look at Arkansas State, when you look at the the Dakota schools, it's not like those were these were necessarily these really easy wins for Nebraska. Let's go back last year. You know what? For about a quarter and a half, almost two full quarters. Fordham played very well against Nebraska. It's it's not like Nebraska just wiped them off the field first play of the game and it was over. Fordham hung in there. Now, obviously Nebraska was incredibly more athletic, had had way more depth than what Fordham had, and they kind of I mean late set mid late second quarter Turnovers killed Fordham. It kind of the game kind of got out of hand there late second quarter, but it's not like that was a blowout from day one. And I mean, and I'm, and you know, if you want to point a comparison, you go back to ninety four, ninety five. Nebraska played uh, Pacific, which was actually, I mean, they were a D, they were a one A, they were an FBS school. Yeah, but they were horrible. They were horrible. I'm not discounting that. Those games were over by the third play of the game. True. They had all starters yanked by the end of the first quarter in both games, and that was decided before kickoff even. Nebraska had their starters in against Fordham for the better part of the third quarter. And it's because Fordham was playing really good football against them. Now, a little bit of a different time period, scholarship limits, et cetera, all of that playing into it. But it's one of those situations where, you know, at this point in time, if Nebraska plays an FCS team, it's not an automatic, you, hey, you're going to chalk this up as a win. I mean, Appalachian State did beat Michigan. You've got a, you've got some of these Dakota schools who have in fact knocked off Power Five schools. That stuff does happen, and so I don't think you you can. It, this is you know the North Dakota game. It's a lose lose for Nebraska because if they win, nobody's going to care at all, and I don't think it's a well, very good measuring and, stick and, against the rest of the and, Big and Ten. And that's why I said the next the next measurement isn't till Oklahoma. Exactly. You can yeah. be two and one going to Oklahoma 
and you 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 still don't know what to expect because th- that's where you're going to be measured. I 100 percent agree with you. I'm just saying you can't you can't just automatically chalk up the next two games as automatic wins. They probably are. I mean, you got about a 99 percent chance in my mind that they are wins. But I don't think, I mean, I'm just saying you can't automatically assume it's going to happen anymore, especially with this Nebraska. Did any part of you think Scott Frost was going to get fired like Lane Kiffin getting off the plane yesterday? Yeah, I'd heard rumors to that extent. I, I'm not saying I believed him wholly, but I mean, there, there was always scuttlebutt about the fact that there is an... Again, I don't have any factual basis in terms of, oh yeah, I saw this in writing, this was going to happen. There's plenty of smoke in relation to the fire that said Trev was willing to make make a move last year and that Osborne talked him out of it. Now, I wasn't at those meetings. I, you know, I don't know that that happened for a fact, but I've talked to enough people who have said, hey, this is what we heard from so-and-so who's a big booster, this and that. Um, The telling thing for me is that at Big Ten Media Days, when Trev Alberts was asked, is there a number, is there a cutoff, is there this benchmark win total that Frost has to hit to keep his job? And Trev's response was no, no. There is not a number. And that was one of those that I I think most fans heard that and took that to mean, oh, Frost could actually, he he might be able to lose less than six, or he could win less than six games this year. He could lose more than six, and Frost might still keep his job. And my interpretation of Trez's comment was, Scott could win six or more and still lose his job. It's not based upon a number of wins. And and so I, I guess what I'm trying to say here is that at this point, I think anything's a potential. You know what? Scott loses to Northwestern. Trev pulls the trigger. Maybe Scott coaches the whole season, takes him to a bowl game. They win the bowl game, and Trev just goes, okay, listen, we went 7-6 and six on the year. That's not good enough. We need to see more than that out of this How about team. the Irish reporter asking him if he'd ever resign? No coach is ever going to resign. They want well, to get fired because they want to buy out. I don't know. Maybe there's some weird thing with soccer over there where if you look bad enough, you – resigning is it's it's like it's like the honorable thing to do i don't know (laughs) the uh, yes i'm going to resign my position oh that's australian (laughs) though isn't it uh i can't do an irish accent but you're right i mean i'm not even gonna try there's no way a coach would resign unless you're getting one hell of a pay no you resign unless you unless you've got something built in and writing that says if you if you suck ass and resign, we'll pay out yeah. X amount of your contract. Yes. But no contract has that in it. No. And so, I mean, he was asked. I mean, he did say in this business you got to win. He knows that. And he knows – nobody knows his seat's hotter. It's the hottest seat in the country. No, he gets it. And that's you know that's the one thing I would say in strong defense of Frost is the fact that – I think if if Trev had come in and made a change last year, I guarantee you Frost would have understood. Well, I think he gets it now. I mean, I, I think Frost would love to be the guy that turns this around. But at whatever point in time, if things continue to go downhill, if we continue to see what we saw yesterday and Frost gets fired... I guarantee you, Frost is going to be the first guy to say, "Hey, yeah, no, I totally get it." Yeah, and and I understand. Don't cry any tears for him because he'll have millions of dollars to walk out the door with. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I mean that's and I you know and I understand the stress. I mean, if you look at Frost, he looks like he's aged ten years in the last five. He looks fit though. Got some biceps on him. He's been working out. 
And hell, he still feels like a 10-year-old. He slid, yeah, but down, I mean, he slid down the banisters at, uh, at exactly. Memorial Stadium. But, I mean, his face, I mean, it just – he looks like he is aged. Yes. There's a lot of pressure with that. It's not an easy job. It, no, and I get that. And, I mean, you can talk about how – like I think a lot of people at Senior go like, dude, I'll go do that job for $5 million a year. It, you know, that, that, that type of salary comes with expectations. Did you read the newspaper? Because uh, uh, Tom Chattel, Sam McEwen, and Dirk Chattel weren't very nice to, to Scott Frost after the first game of the year. All right. That, well, that, you lost. So. Well, it, well, that's true. And and that's only Omaha media. They're kind compared to if you live you lived oh. in New York. Oh, my God. I still remember when I moved out there. It's like, yeah, the rose-colored glass has come off. There, There's no candy coating once you leave the local media. Doctor, you know, I feel like we had a melancholy podcast. Usually we're like upbeat, telling jokes, first 20 minutes about what happened in our well, life. Well, you're begging on me about the fact that we've gone like, I've been in your basement for two hours. Yeah, but you know, we got rocking, to Rocking, rocking docs. Aren't the, you excited the new, about the, the new, stuff we're doing? Yeah, we've got the docs diagnosis is coming back. We've been working with the big screen. There's like some new tech I've, I've, I've I got to get used to here with this stuff. There's cameras rolling. We're on YouTube. All of a sudden, I got to look good. You know what this means is my credit rating's down to like 740 now because I've purchased so many things on credit. You just said down to 740? <laughs> you know, I know a guy. Uh, there's this Steve dude who can like hook you up with a good credit deal. No, my credit rating's like 810. Holy crap, dude. Because I don't like... My mortgage is my biggest debt. Yeah, we all. Got and you know, one. you know what? The, you want to raise your you want to raise your credit score? Pay your bills on time. That's how you raise your credit score. You can have debt. Just pay your bills. That's all you got to do. It, it, some for some people, that's not as easy as it sounds. Yeah, you're complaining about your 700 plus credits. <laughs> credit rating and I'm sitting there going like well yeah that's actually really good. I know I, should, I know I'm not bragging I'm not bragging uh, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, and listen uh, and keep watching for the Doc's Diagnosis presented by Centris Federal Credit Union one's going to drop on Monday Tuesday and Wednesday live Wednesday night it's going behind the point spread with Scott Spritzer uh, make sure to like our Facebook page follow Dr. Rob on Twitter at Doc Talk Sports follow me Travis Justice at Travis Creates uh, what am I missing Connor Orr, thank Connor you so Orr, much. Connor Orr, Scotty Strong, And of course, uh, Betfred Sports. Download that app. Brand new signups in Colorado, Iowa, and Arizona. Get a $20 free bet by using the promo code DOCTALK. We'll talk to you next week on the Doc Talk Podcast, presented by the Betfred Sportsbook. Book.